There are plenty of ways to feel light in life, some more legal than others. But today, we're taking things to the extreme. We are going all the way to full-on general anesthesia. Yep, our guy Gustav is about to completely let himself go. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking just your average anesthesia, no no. Instead, we're going to give him a record-breaking anesthesia knockout, 48 hours under. Okay. So, is anesthesia as dangerous as people say? Will Gustav wake up in the middle of surgery? Or worse, what if he doesn't wake up at all? And if he does survive, what kind of condition will he be in? There's no time to waste, and since we're not doing anything halfway, we'll be cutting off eight of Gustav's fingers to make sure he actually gets into the operating room. That way, we'll finally get the answer to our big question. 48 hours under general anesthesia? What's it like? Normally, you never go under anesthesia without a consultation with an anesthesiologist first. That meeting is very important because it's when they check for things like allergies and also ask for your height and weight. And let me be clear, if you're self-conscious about your weight and intend to lie about it, I don't recommend that at all. Because the anesthesia dosage is based on your weight, and you do not want them getting that wrong. A wrong dosage of anesthesia can have serious consequences. In fact, 7% of anesthesia-related deaths are due to dosage errors. So yeah, not a great idea to mislead your doctor. That said, Gustav won't be lying because he won't even have the opportunity. Remember, he's coming in as an emergency case after losing fingers. So no time for a pre-operation chat. This means the doctors have to guess at his weight. They just have to eyeball it. Time is of the essence when you could lose eight fingers. And with that, we're off to the operating room. General anesthesia can't just be improvised. You can't wing it without serious consequences. In order for the anesthesia to work properly, the patient's supposed to show up on an empty stomach. That means no food for at least six hours and no drinks for at least three hours before surgery. Luckily for us, Gustav checks all the boxes. One unexpected perk for Gustav, if we can call it that, is that he skipped a long, stressful wait before going into surgery. And for a lot of people, that wait can be extremely anxiety-inducing. Some are terrified they won't wake up. Others are scared the doctors might take advantage of their sleeping bodies while they're out cold? It's rare, but yeah, unfortunately, abuse can happen. There have been cases where medical students were trained to do pelvic or rectal exams on unconscious patients on anesthesia without asking for the patient's consent. And what made the scandal even worse is that apparently it's not that uncommon. Some say it's even standard practice. And that's not even counting the stress of the surgery itself. Hence, the little sedative offered to patients a few hours before putting them to sleep to relax them before the big loss of control. All right, here we go. Time for the actual anesthesia. Oh, the mask? That's just for oxygen. The real knockout punch is coming through the IV in a few seconds. And to be precise, Gustav isn't actually asleep. He's in a state that's more like a medically induced coma. In fact, he can't even breathe on his own. He needs to be intubated quickly, which means sticking a tube down his throat and hooked up to an artificial respirator. If we left him without artificial help to breathe, he'd be dead within minutes. That's actually why you're supposed to be given anesthesia on an empty stomach. If there's food in your stomach, the tube can make you throw up, and if that happens, you risk inhaling your own vomit. Not exactly the most glamorous way to kick the bucket. But in emergency situations like this one, even if the patient has eaten recently, sometimes doctors have to take the risk. And in those cases, they press on the throat to try and block anything from coming back up as best they can. And after that, you just cross your fingers and hope lunch doesn't make a comeback mid-surgery. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly did we give Gustav to knock him out this hard? The answer is hypnotics. And there are quite a few different ones that can be used depending on the situation. In this category, we find nitrous oxide, for example, which has been misused by the general public in recent years and is very dangerous. But that's not what we're talking about here because it's not strong enough. In reality, much more powerful and fast-acting substances are used like etomidate, propofol, and many others. I'm not gonna get into specifics of how they work, but because we still won't fully understand them even in 2025. What we can say, however, is that they generally affect the central nervous system. To put it simply, it basically switches off the brain. Ran a bit of info for you, it was actually a propofol overdose that killed Michael Jackson. No idea why he was regularly taking anesthetic drugs, but anyway, it's a powerful substance, that's for sure. For a quick bit of history, early anesthesia looked nothing like it does today. The very first so-called modern anesthesia was 
was performed in 1846, and back then they used extremely dangerous substances like ether or chloroform, and they carried significant risks, including death or severe cognitive damage, so yeah, you either died or woke up barely functioning. If you go even further back in time, some surgeons actually tried to distract patients from the pain of surgery by rubbing nettles on their bodies. Yeah. Nettles. Imagine getting something amputated and you're supposed to stop feeling the pain because someone's slapping you with stinging plants. Ouch. Anyway, all that said, we've come a long way. These days, patrons are practically pampered and receive a lot of comfort in comparison to back then. Look at Gustav, wrapped up in a heated blanket, getting five-star treatment total comfort. Actually, part of the reason for the blanket is that anesthesia can cause hypothermia, but everything's carefully set up to prevent hypothermia from happening. Brain monitor shows Gustav's totally out, so we're all set to operate on his fingers. But will he feel anything? Most hypnotics don't actually block pain at all, which is why general anesthesia always includes painkillers as well. His general anesthesia isn't just one drug, it's a mix, and one key part of that mix is painkillers, also known as analgesics. And we're not talking mild stuff here, it's usually morphine-based medications. But there's still one more problem, what if Gustav moves during surgery? Even with hypnotics and morphine, there's still a chance the body might twitch or spasm, which is not at all ideal when someone's working with tiny surgical tools. That's why there's sometimes a final ingredient in the anesthesia recipe, something called curare. These are substances that paralyze you, no movement at all. In fact, they were originally discovered by indigenous peoples in the Americas who used them to coat their hunting arrows, paralyzing their prey. This is the most dangerous part of modern anesthesia as some people are allergic to curare type drugs. But it's important to keep the risk in perspective. Very few people are actually allergic and even if you do have an allergic reaction, there's a 95% chance you'll survive it. So with all that in place, hypnotics, painkillers, and muscle relaxants, we're all set for a smooth, stable operation. The goal of a successful surgery, of course, is to wake up at the right time. Because, well, not waking up is obviously bad, but waking up too early is almost just as bad. It might sound a little funny, but yeah, it actually happens. Around 1 in 20,000 people experience some level of awareness or consciousness during surgery. It also depends on the type of surgery. For example, it's more common during C-sections with about 1 in every 670 cases feeling some level of awareness. But let's be clear, this doesn't mean someone just suddenly wakes up mid-surgery. It's more like they're somewhat aware, maybe hearing voices or understanding bits of conversation, but usually without feeling any pain. So basically, you go home with some hazy little memories. It can still be a seriously traumatizing experience though. You're trapped in your own body, unable to breathe on your own, while surgeons are cutting you open completely unaware that you're conscious. Having said that, the worst case scenario is, of course, not waking up at all. In Gustav's case, thankfully he didn't wake up during the surgery. But the real question is, will he wake up at all after 48 hours of being knocked out? General anesthesia still has a bit of a scary reputation, mostly due to a study from the 1980s that claimed you have a 1 in 10,000 chance of dying from general anesthesia. That's an alarming study, but I can assure you we've made huge progress since the 80s. Nowadays, it's estimated that only one in every 145,000 deaths is directly caused by anesthesia. That means it's about 15 times safer than it was 40 years ago. Yes, human error, especially in dosing, can still happen, but the safety protocols are now so tight that on average, there's only one error for every 133 anesthesias. That might sound like a lot, but for comparison, even in aviation, which is super regulated, there are on average four errors per flight. Next to that, one error for every every 133 patients is nothing, especially when we know that the overwhelming majority of errors don't lead to death. That said, there is one worrying thing for Gustav. The longer an anesthesia lasts, the greater the risk of dying from it. First, the drug needs to stop being administered, and then we wait for the patient to slowly wake up. But let's face it, no one wants to wake up with a tube down their throat. That's why they remove the breathing tube before the patient wakes up. And usually, the anesthesiologist manually helps them breathe using a mask and a bag until they can breathe on their own again. And just like that, looks like Gustav is starting to breathe on his own now. Well, and he looks like he's gonna make it. He'll hang out in the operating room a little longer, and if all goes well, he'll be heading to the recovery room soon. 
we've now made it to the recovery room, which is an in-between stage, after surgery but before the patient goes back to their hospital room with minimal monitoring from staff. Why do you ask? Well, because waking up can take anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour, and during that time the patient needs to be closely monitored in case of anything life-threatening. But there's no point in keeping them in the operating room, surgeons and other patients are waiting to use that space. Gustavo is starting to open his eyes slowly. But wow, he looks completely out of it. Still, it's definitely possible to survive a general anesthesia this long, and one man is living proof. His name is Michael Bates, and he once had to undergo a 47-hour surgery after getting eight fingers crushed in an industrial press. Incredibly, he only lost one finger. The surgeons managed to reattach all the other seven fingers. That said, waking up after this kind of anesthesia is definitely no walk in the park. Once the anesthesia wears off, people often experience a relatively severe sore throat from the breathing tube and a pretty serious wave of nausea from the anesthetic drugs. It's not uncommon for patients to still feel really cold after coming out of the operating room. Luckily, a few meds through an IV and a warm blanket are usually enough to help with them. As for our guy Gustav, we'll let him rest and recover for now, just long enough for him to come to his senses back in his hospital room. Gustav is still going to be pretty out of it for a while, but at this point there's no more serious risk and he'll be able to go home soon. For a few days, he might still feel a bit off, like tiredness, maybe a slight dip in mood, and even trouble concentrating or remembering things. Don't worry, that usually only lasts a few days. In rare cases, yeah, it can stick around for several months, but that's really not the norm. In any case, as you've probably gathered, general anesthesia isn't something to take lightly. That's why doctors always prefer to go with local anesthesia whenever possible. Still, when it's really necessary, general anesthesia is an incredible tool and one that is now very safe and well understood. So if you've got surgery coming up soon where general anesthesia is necessary, I hope all this info helps you feel a little more at ease.